Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Amy Fritz to you. Amy has a really interesting background, and I think the talk that she's going to give today is going to be of pretty great interest to anyone who's considering education, which means if you are in education, like all of our students, or if you're trying to deliver education, like all of our faculty, I think you'll find her talk particularly interesting. So Amy has a really interesting background. She's a nat native of Minnesota, and she was previously a park ranger. She then received two bachelor's degrees from, in, from MIT, one in electrical engineering and the other in physics, dual bachelor's degrees. Her master's degree specialized in optics, which followed in the footsteps of her parents. And now she's at Stanford studying electrical engineering education. So she comes to us with the background that we're experienced with, with the, the technology, but also this really interesting uh, science of engineering education. So. Amy, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes, thank you, Cindy, for the introduction. Um, I'm at Stanford University finishing up my PhD right now. And so this is my thesis work I'm presenting to you right now, which um, should be complete this summer. So we've been working on creating a circuit debugging simulator. And this whole talk will be about all the complicated things that went into making it and what we've learned as a result. So over here on the right, I have some pictures of some of our TAs during debugging training. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't show their pictures for privacy reasons, but I put that face on there because I love their inquisitive looks as they get confused when they're trying to debug these circuits. Um, so I'll start by telling you guys why we chose to study circuit debugging. And then I'll talk a little bit about the class that we've implemented all of these activities in. Um, and then I'll show you the pilot studies and how we came to the realization that we really needed a simulator and how we designed that circuit simulator and some preliminary results. And then I'll tell you what our next steps are and also mention just a few other projects in case people wanted to ask about those other projects during the discussion time. So first of all, I wanna say that we use the word debugging and troubleshooting interchangeably. Um, there's some controversy about this within the education world. Um, some people say the word debugging is only for CS world, um, but my advisor is both a professor in the CS department and the EE department, and we both strongly feel that the word debugging also applies to circuits, so I will be using debugging throughout this presentation. And so debugging is a specialized form of troubleshooting. And there's actually been a lot of research done in the education world about problem solving. And we subscribe to the philosophy that it is a series of decisions. And there's been a lot of work done on that by Carl Wyman's group at Stanford University. He's in the physics department and does physics education research. And so here's a link to a paper. Um, if somebody were to want to go read more about their expert decision making lists for problem solving. So I'll just briefly show you the, the list of cognitive steps we show the TAs when we're training them um, about debugging with students. So you kind of get an idea of the cognitive steps we're thinking about. And these steps very closely relate to things represented in the paper above and also in previous um, problem solving literature over the years. So first of all, we say the student needs to know that there's something that needs troubleshooting. Sometimes that's easy. It's an LED out, um, not lit up, or a motor not running. Other times it's more difficult for them if perhaps they're trying to check the gain of their amplifier. And if they don't know what the gain is supposed to be, that's gonna be a problem for checking whether it's working or not. And other things, it may be just a question of, is it close enough, right? Because resistors, they often use have up to 5% tolerance. So what is an acceptable deviance from your theory? Um, and then if they do find that there's a problem, then they're going to have to go and start kind of using deeper models to examine the problem and figure out what's going on. And there's going to be a lot of comparing of their, their expectations with the experimental results. And actually, the professors for this class always joke with the students that they shouldn't even be doing an experiment if they don't have an expectation first. So that's something we really drill into them. And then they will need to brainstorm possible explanations, um, somehow prioritize those to decide which ones to check first and come up with some kind of test to check those. And then what I consider most important is that they actually iterate through this list as they get more information. 
they have to kind of update their state of what they think is wrong and keep iterating until they find the problem. So these are the kind of cognitive processes we're trying to somehow look at with our um, debugging activities that we do with students. So uh, the next question is, why do we choose circuit debugging? Because my, my background is actually in optics. So partially it was the class they let us work with, which was the intro circuits class. But more importantly, like we think the most important skill learned in that intro circuits class is debugging. And we've noticed many students struggle with this. If any of you TA or teach, you may have noticed the students who are struggling to figure out what's wrong and they kind of sit there on their hands, not doing anything. You come back 10 minutes later, they haven't really tried anything because they're completely lost and just don't even know where to start. And we see that so often that we wanted to find ways to intervene and hopefully help them on their journey. And we also hope ultimately to improve our instruction through this. Uh, and literature agrees with us. So turns out there's a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she interviewed a bunch of physics professors actually who were teaching circuits classes. And the majority of those professors said that troubleshooting was their main learning objective for their labs. And almost all of them admitted that they didn't have any debugging curriculum at all. So there's definitely a need here. And if you wanna learn more about what she found in her interviews, you can go to that paper. So here's the class we get to work with. It's the intro circuits class at Stanford and it's based around the maker culture. So they have four main projects they're building and we have about a quarter of the student body goes through our class. So it's offered every quarter, we're on the quarter system here. And we have 100 to 200 students each quarter. And we give them half their grade based on lab and we actually grade their quality of their labs. We grade their soldering, we grade the quality of the product they build. Um, and they're really fun labs. So the first one they build is a solar charger for their cell phone. The second one is a useless box. So basically you flip the switch and all the useless boxes, it, it comes, the arm comes out and flips the switch back off. Um, the third project they build is an LED display. So this student made the snake game on their eight by eight LED display and they've added some buttons there so they can do input into the Arduino um, to control where the snake moves. And then finally, they build an EKG. This is a very messy student's EKG, um, but then they get waveforms out at the end, like on the right is the goal. So originally, <laughs> our plan was to really focus on these cognitive steps and look and see which ones students struggle with the most, and then create interventions to improve performance. We are honestly now two and a half years later, just getting to this point, um, unfortunately. So we ended up having to spend a very long time on how do you quantitatively measure debugging? Yeah. So basically that is what my thesis turned into was creating some kind of tools for how do we quantitatively measure debugging? And so we did a lot of attempts before we got to our debugging simulator. So one attempt we made was we did debugging journals. Um, so students were asked after each lab to turn in like a paragraph basically answering these four questions. How did you know there was a problem? What possible causes did you consider? How did you resolve the problem? And what did you learn about debugging for next time? Um, while they were somewhat promising, there were a lot of problems with this. First of all, how much students write varies very much from student to student. It was really enlightening when you get two students who wrote it separately instead of together who were partners. And so you'd see what one wrote versus what the other wrote. And like one of them would be missing like half the details of like the things they noticed to solve the problem. And so that kind of disconnect made it very clear. It's hard with the writing to really fully collect their thought process. And how do you really, in the end, differentiate between a student who knew it was going on, but just didn't write much and somebody who had no idea what was going on and wrote as much as they could. And then also we had a lot of problems with TAs varying in their standards. So even though we tried to create debugging training for the TAs, they still, some were much nicer in their grading than others. So then you get varying levels of 
um, completeness from various lab sections. So it just was not ideal for running a quantitative analysis of debugging. But we did learn some interesting things about um, debugging. I think probably the most interesting thing I learned was the number of students who wrote down that what they learned were kind of realms of where things can go wrong. So for example, they might write, oh, comp individual components can be broken when they come from China. Or they would write like, uh, it can be user error that causes the problem. Like I didn't know how to use the oscilloscope. So they were kind of realizing that they always automatically assumed it was they miswired something. And they were slowly kind of expanding their ideas to include these other realms of possibility. So then we also looked into observing students in lab. And this is a very time intensive process. You could have each TA sit with a group for 10 minutes and watch them debug. And I'm sure it'd be very apparent very quickly um, who can debug and who can't. Um, but it's gonna be, like I say, impractical with 100 to 200 students a term. So each TA is gonna be doing separate students. So again, you're gonna have TA variants, um, so not ideal. Um, and furthermore, we actually, on the way to doing this, started out by recording the TAs debugging at a training session once. And it turns out a lot of our TAs can't debug effectively. <laughs> um, so that was of concern to us also um, when we were thinking about using them as observers. Um, there, it was clear that they needed a lot of training before they could even be used as valid observers for us. Um, so that kind of took us to this point of wondering what do we do? We're looking through the literature and we did find again that lady in um, UC Boulder. She actually has published studies where she observed people in lab. So it's very time intensive and it was a multi-stage op-amp circuit. So very kind of similar to the things we're doing in introductory circuits. Um, but like I say, it's very time intensive doing things where you observe students in labs. So she had eight pairs of students in her study, which is a very small number. And they basically were looking at what cognitive tasks the students were um, engaged in throughout the troubleshooting session. And so they were looking at four specific cognitive tasks, which are named differently, but very similar to the ones I showed you in the green box earlier. So they, they broke it down into formulate problem description, generate causes test, and repair and evaluate. And they found that indeed all the groups used all of these at some point during debugging. And not surprisingly, they're doing a lot more formulate problem description in the first half and they're doing mostly test and repair and evaluate in the second half and generate causes were kind of all over. So that's a short summary. And again, here's the paper referenced if anybody would like to go read more about that. So this is why we decided to move online because we really want to quantitatively measure hundreds of students per term. And so we also want to gather snapshots of the debugging process. So a problem with a paper and pencil test, and we did try paper and pencil tests over the last few years, is that they can erase stuff, right? They only show us their final product on the test. They don't want us to see all their like missed thoughts beforehand, but we really want to know their missed thoughts. So um, the nice thing about doing it on the computer is they click next and they can't like erase what they wrote before. And so we're trying to collect their actions and thoughts step by step, not just their final answer. And also, this allows us to see how they interact with new information. We can, like, for example, allow them to take measurements on a circuit sequentially and see like, what measurements do they take in what order and at what point do they think they're done. Um, so this just allows a lot more interaction like that that you can't have on a paper and pencil test. And it was also very convenient with COVID that we had already started making all this before COVID. And so we were ready for online learning because we were already making online <laughs> debugging simulations. Uh, so our first pilot was actually in fall 2019. And we made it in Qualtrics because they have really great um, backend data storage for you. And so we, basically the students could ask for the measurements at various locations. And here's a picture of the very first one we had. So they could only measure the voltage at six points. Um, they could also ask for the resistance of the resistors. So it was a very limited options thing, but it was our very first run. And at the end, there was some open-ended questions. So we asked them first, like, what was the purpose of the circuit? This was a, a non-inverting amplifier. Um, we asked them what the gain was. We asked them what their plan was for measuring things and looked at whether they followed that plan. Um, and then finally we asked them, is this circuit working or not? 
and consistently from term to term as we change the um, the activity it's always around 10 to 15 percent of students will say yes the circuit's working that's fairly consistent um, and then we ask for their reasoning of why it is or isn't working and how they would fix the problem if it wasn't working and so it was very useful to get these open-ended answers because we were then able to use those in the future to create closed form solutions or multiple choice answers for students to pick from. Um, so there were several limitations to these first pilots. Um, one problem is that when I ask where do you, which point do you wanna take a measurement at? That assumes they know how to stick the black probe of their, their multimeter in ground and things like that. And it became apparent watching students in lab that that was an assumption we should not make with confidence. Um, so we knew there was some amount of students who probably if we gave them the power to take their own measurements, they would not take proper measurements. So we wanted to add a way for them to take their own measurements. Also, these open ended answers are still really hard to analyze it takes a lot of time for me to go through categorize every answer. Um, and that's called coding in the education world. Um, so we want to be able to somehow move towards multiple choice like answers that are relevant still. And then also we ran into this problem of what happens if a student like gets really lost. So if they get the gain wrong from the get go, so they're expecting something completely different, then their answers are very different than everybody else's. They're kind of off in their own little world in terms of the type of actions they're taking and the reasoning they're giving. And so we really wondered, this makes it like, we just weren't getting as good of data after that point where they make the mistake. So we wanted to somehow create some kind of guardrail to bring them back on track, both so we can get more data about their journey and also help them ultimately. So that's how we ended up designing a simulator. And this is the important things we really wanted in a simulator. First of all, we wanted multiple circuit representations. So we want both a theoretical diagram and a physical circuit. That was very important to us. And I think this picture was from the second term pilot, so winter 2020. Um, so now you can see there's more places you can measure the voltage. Um, and then we also wanted it to be choose your own adventure so we could have those kind of guardrails. So basically now what happens is they get to take their own measurements or do their own tests on the circuit because sometimes it's a word-based adventure in Qualtrics. And uh, we see how they react to the new data, what they choose to do next. And we're recording which what thing they choose to do each step of the way. And then instead of getting it points for like getting it right in the end, you get points for basically completing the activity. So that was kind of a new way of thinking about it is we're putting the emphasis on completing the activity, finding the answer in the end. It doesn't matter how long you take. And so this is how we're also trying to, because like there's always the word that students will like kind of copy each other's answers. And when you're on a choose it, your own adventure like this, it's a mystery and you don't want them to <laughs> just like ask their friend what the answer is. So that's why we've tried really hard to always have it be like the points aren't associated with like correctness in the normal sense. Um, so before in the pilot studies, we were actually having them get points for just doing it. They didn't get points for correctness. So um, this is good and bad because now we get their true thoughts. Um, sometimes we get half-baked thoughts. So maybe they aren't trying quite as hard because they know they don't get points on correctness. But I also get to know like something they would normally maybe be too afraid to say. And we oftentimes give them a choice, a pull down menu of, I don't know, as a choice of what you think is currently wrong with the circuit. So it's been interesting to see how, they, how often they use that and in what contexts also. And then here's an example of one of the pull down menus we had created for one of the choose your own adventures. So like each round, they'd have to say what, what they thought was wrong, their current guess. And then they could choose based on what they said they thought was wrong, it would give them a small list of five, six options of a test they could do to the circuit to check on that. And this is one example down below. And it would obviously then give them the answer like, oh, you replaced the batteries and it's still not working. And then the third thing we really wanted our simulator to involve was uh, we wanted to minimize open-ended answers. Cause like I say, that's really hard to um, and tedious to grade. And so this would simplify our analysis, but we also don't want it to, to compromise the integrity of our measurements. So here's an example of a question where they were actually asked basically, which of these could be a problem, be what's wrong with the circuit based on the symptoms listed? And then they drag and drop 
everything that they thought was possible and they were supposed to order it based on what they thought was most likely. So kind of prioritizing. And then anything that was definitely not possible, like a resistor being backwards is definitely not possible because resistors don't have directionality um, would be an example of something that should be sorted into not possible. Um, and so we actually in fall 20, yes, in fall 2019, I think, it, wait. yes, it was in fall 2019, I think, uh, we actually ran some of these where half the class was given open-ended and half the class was given these drag and drop. And we were thinking, well, maybe we're affecting them, right? With the drag and drop, more people will get to the right answer because the, the, the idea is given to them. They didn't have to brainstorm or generate the idea themselves, but it turns out performance didn't really vary between the two groups. And we did this on several homeworks and there was never any statistical difference between the two groups. So that made us fairly confident that we could continue on with using these multiple choice. Um, and if you wanna see whether it affects them long-term getting multiple choice over and over again, that would be, have to be a separate study. Um, but at least in isolated incidences of using it one time, it didn't affect their, their responses. So then to actually make the simulator, we actually hired an undergrad in computer science at Stanford last summer. And um, so basically I would make him these images in fritzing of the breadboard. And so he would embed them in a, on a canvas in HTML. And then he wrote JavaScript code so that students could essentially, um, there'd be a button down below here, which you can't see where they click and say, I wanna move the red probe. And then they could just like click here. And then, uh, the red probe would move to that hole where they clicked. And so they can actually take their own measurements. And then we store the voltages um, in a JSON file. So it's stored row by row on the breadboard. Um, and the reason we did that is because we're trying to do the simpler thing first and hoping someday to add a simulator underneath. But some of the nice benefits of this actually is I can model, for example, very easily a broken um, a broken op amp, which you maybe couldn't do normally in a simulator. And also I always pull real data then. Like I actually go physically measure a circuit and put the numbers in so that students have like a real example from the lab. And then, like I say, um, he's made this all, set this all up so that basically all we have to replace is the JSON file and the image file, and then you put a new assignment up. So he made it very easy for us to use. And then there's a MySQL database on the back end that he set up for us so that we collect all of their measurements at what time they took them and at what order they took them. So we can reconstruct their measurements. So for our first simulation, we chose, oh, is there a question? No, okay. Um, for our first simulation, we chose material at the end of terms who wanted them to be as advanced as possible in their debugging skills because they are novices. Um, so that ended up being op amps come at the end of term. And then we wanted something that couldn't be found just by looking at the circuit and finding a miswiring. So we ended up choosing a problem where there was a loose wire in the feedback loop. So looking at that picture I showed you on the previous screen, you couldn't actually see it visually what was wrong with the circuit. You had to actually take measurements. So Amy, yeah. there is actually a question. Um, how much variation was there in the individual student schematics? Like, did they all have the same one or did they have to develop it themselves? Oh, you mean the theoretical diagram that goes with it? So they were always just given the theoretical diagram because the way this class works on this intro class is they're always given the circuit they're gonna build in lab. So it's, there's, less design involved in this intro class. It's more about getting them into lab and confident that they can build things themselves. So they're always given the theoretical thing they're trying to build. So we always gave them that theoretical circuit, but we did ask them to calculate gain. We did ask them what the purpose of the circuit was. Um, and in the end that ended up becoming like a giant list of like every op amp circuit they saw, right? Like summing amplifier or differential amplifier or like unity buffer. Like it was just like a list of those and they pick which thing it is. Um, so those are the kind of questions they did have to answer on their own. Okay, so um, 
basically how the simulation goes is um, we broke it down into these checkpoints, like I was just saying with the gain, et cetera. And they can't move to the next section until it's correct. So these are kind of my guardrails. So here are the checkpoints I created for this op amp problem. And you'll see the questions they get on the right. So first of all, we asked them what the purpose of the circuit was. And I tried using the text parsing feature of Qualtrics, which was a failure. It was working when I was testing it beforehand. This was all piloted in, um, in winter term, so just a few months ago. And then when I went to actually run it on the day of, when they all do the homework, nobody's answers got parsed correctly. So I don't know if that's on my end, Qualtrics end, but there's text parsing. Um, we'll have to keep exploring that one. So it's good I did a follow-up of multiple choice to them afterwards. Um, and then we asked them about the gain. Um, next, we asked them about their measurement tools because one thing we had noticed in all these pre-studies was that a lot of students just assumed they needed to use an oscilloscope because they always used an oscilloscope in lab with the op amps. So they kind of made this false model in their head that these two things were connected. And so this is a situation where they are giving them a constant signal in time. So a digital multimeter is a much easier way to go about this. Um, but about 10% of students consistently every term will say, oh, no, I want to use an oscilloscope. That's the right tool in this case. Um, so we just wanted to keep checking and that has been consistent term after term 10%. Um, and then we also asked them to measure the input voltage. So this was a good checkpoint to see if they could actually do measurements before they started checking random places in the circuit. So we had them start at a given place so we know what they're trying to measure and see how long it takes them. And then finally, we asked them after they take all the measurements they want, is the circuit working or not? And then finally, we asked them for follow-up reasoning. And if their answer isn't the thing that's actually wrong with the circuit, then they're told not quite, please investigate more. And that's the whole choose your own adventure, you're looped back. So we've done this two terms now where we've given them this debugging simulator, the full-fledged one. And there were about 120, 120 students in fall and about 120 students, 120 students in winter term. And usually on any given homework, I can get responses from 100 of them. Um, the rest, I guess, deem it not worth the points on the homework or something. And we're all remote learning in labs right now at Stanford. So this has all been done remotely. All they're learning about debugging, all they're learning about building circuits has been remote these last two terms when we've been deploying the simulator. So in fall, we didn't have the guardrails and we still had open-ended answers. And we actually use those open-ended answers then to create um, closed form answers in winter. And then in winter, we added the checkpoints. So you can't move on until you get the gain right. You get like five chances. And if you still haven't figured it out, we'll tell you the answer at that point or how to calculate gain before moving you on. And then also we created five other adventures, text-based adventures in Qualtrics. So these ones didn't allow you to take like a measurement on a breadboard, but they would allow you to do things like replace the battery or turn the LED around if you think the LED is backward and that's why it's not lighting up, back, things like that. And it was a text adventure and you say what you want to do and it tells you the results of your experiment. So preliminary data. Um, it's a little harder to analyze the data now because we don't have like right or wrong answers as a metric. It's more like how circuitous was your path through this whole thing to the end. Um, and so one obvious starting point would be to look at how many attempts each student took at each checkpoint. So on the right here, I've put a reminder of what all those checkpoints were for the op amp problem. And then on the left here, I have a graph of basically the gray shows the students who on the first try got it right. And the tan shows the students who here, who after we said, nope, that's not right, on their second, third, or fourth guess, they corrected themselves. So I see the, the promising part of this graph is those are the students we helped by putting these guardrails on because we self-corrected them and we didn't have to actually give them the answer. They self-corrected themselves after we gave just the feedback that you're wrong. Um, and then we have a small amount of students, less than 10%, who even after five tries um, still didn't have the right answer. 
And I put stars next to the DMM versus oscilloscope because obviously that's a yes or no question. So there weren't like five attempts. Um, and working, I gave a star next to because technically we only gave them four chances to say it was working before we told them, no, it's really not working. And like you can see, there were still a couple students who after four attempts said, yes, it's working. Um, still hadn't decided it was broken. And then finally, I'm currently working on the reasoning and making a graph similar to this. I held off on putting it on here because we're in the middle of data analysis. And it turns out about 25% of students still, still hadn't gotten to the correct answer after 15 guesses as to the reasoning behind what was wrong with the circuit. So we need more checkpoints. Um, and I have some ideas maybe of what we can put in this term to try to help along there. But yeah, it turns out about 20% of the students did right away figure out what was wrong or the correct reasoning for what was wrong with the circuit. And then you've got half the class that's making over five guesses. So we still have some work to do in that realm. Um, so first of all, there's a lot of Python scripting going into analyzing the massive data sets I have right now and all these measurements that students took. Um, so that's something I'm busy with right now. Like I mentioned a second ago, we want to have more checkpoints for that final reasoning section because there's too many students in the struggling category. Um, we also have an experiment we're running this term looking at how reflection helps students. So basically, um, forcing students to tell us what they expect the measurement to be and reflect on it each time and seeing how that affects performance. And then finally, a long-term goal will be to technically in the education world, you need to validate your tools. So we have spent a lot of effort in creating this tool. And so eventually we will need to show that it is indeed an effective tool and show how experts perform on it compared to novices and various tests like that. Um, but finally, I wanna leave you with a very positive note, which is our student feedback from the last term about these debugging activities. So a plurality of students said they really enjoyed these assignments. Students would be asking like, when's the next one coming out? Because they were really excited about them and people are not normally that excited about homework. So that was very exciting to see their energy for these um, interactive assignments. Um, after the first assignment, we asked them how easy was this Qualtrics interface to navigate? And most of them say it's easy to navigate, which is good. Um, when we move on to the sixth assignment where they get to take their own measurements, they do say it's somewhat less intuitive now, but they're still on average saying it is at least somewhat intuitive. So um, it makes sense to me that as we made it more complicated, it was gonna be harder to use. because Now they're having to take all their own measurements. Um, and I also think there's some room for improvement for us to make the interface a little easier, um, but at least they are saying it's somewhat intuitive. Uh, we asked them in the final assignment how much they liked the choose your own adventure style, specifically that you get to keep trying until you get it correct. And by and large, they really liked that. So again, yay, we're gonna keep doing this with them. And then finally, we asked them did you learn something about debugging in the first assignment on the very first of these activities they saw? And again, there was a resounding yes, we learned something about debugging, which again encourages us to keep doing these kind of activities with the students. Um, so that is all I wanted to talk about today, but I just wanted to mention that we've also done some studies on conceptual understanding of math equations, and I've done some studies on um, problem solving strategies and how they affect outcomes, performance on various assessments and optics. So if you wanna ask about those, you can also ask about those. Well, thanks, Amy. That's a, a really interesting tool. And okay. it says, in the labs he's worked with in the past, many students like to take the point of least resistance when finishing the labs. And he wonders if you've seen that too. And do you have a way to account for students who might just randomly click through the answers as fast as they could to get the lab done quickly? Yes, I agree. There's definitely evidence of that, that some students are just clicking. And I have decided that I would prefer that over people getting the answers from their friends. Um, but I think the most frustrating thing we've seen besides that in these assessments is the number of students 
who don't even take what I would call enough measurements, right? Like if you're gonna check the gain of your circuit is working, you wanna at least measure the input and the output for starters. And so there's about 15 to 25% of people each term who don't measure that. Some of them it's because I think they aren't capable of figuring out where, where your black probe goes, where your red probe goes. So I think they're just some really lost students and we're actually working on making alerts for them so if we notice like a student's not putting the black probe in like a ground row to maybe like pop an alert. And then we also make note of that on our end um, that they were given that help. So that's one thing we're looking at for some of those students and others of them, it's like you say, I could be, they're just kind of given up. They're like, I don't know what's wrong with it. I measured a few things. I don't really know what's going on. And they just uh, maybe aren't trying that. That is a danger that we do face. Um, and it is that weird balance you want between getting what their thought process honestly versus them feeling like they have to be perfectionists and get it right the first time and them not trying at all. There's some balance you have to find there. Definitely there is. Um, I don't know if you can see the chat, but there are actually several questions there okay. too. If you have ideas about measuring changes in debugging ability before and after the assignment. Yeah, so we actually this term are doing a version of that. So this Friday is the third week of term. It'll be their second debugging assignment. And we actually are putting out a version with LEDs and they actually are taking measurements on the physical breadboard. So this is kind of the beginning of term. And then in week 10, they'll do the same one they did last term with the op amp. And so that way we will have a comparison point of beginning of relatively beginning of term and end of term and see if there are like differences in measurement patterns and differences in ability, hopefully. Did you randomize the problem in the circuit during your testing as in which circuit they were doing? And how did the experts do in your assessments? Yeah, so um, we have done, we ran an ex we ran an extensive experiment in fall, oh gosh, 20, yeah, in 20, fall 2020, where um, we actually slowly added to the um, simulator over the course of the term. So they started out with a, a problem where they were given only the theoretical diagram and all the measurements were given on it. And then they were given a physical um, circuit with all the measurements given on it. And then they were giving a physical circuit where they had to take their own measurements. So we like started like building it up and we did this kind of crafty thing where like it was split over two weeks and then like half the group got one problem with the circuit, the other group got the other problem and then they switched when they went up a level in difficulty of added to the simulation. So we could like control for the variance in like students. And yeah, basically there was not a lot of clean data out of that. The problem was that depending on what is wrong with the circuit heavily influences how well they perform and whether it's easier or harder when you have the physical picture. Um, and so that causes much more variance in the data than maybe how good our simulator is or how much simulation is involved. Um, so we're still kind of playing around with that, trying to get some better answers to that. And in terms of the experts, um, we have like, a couple TAs and the professors for the class were kind of doing them for me at the before they were handed out because we were rushing to push these things out. So these take like 12, 15 hours to make one of these and make all the options and make them circle and make sure all that logic works correctly. Um, so I was like, you know, busy on the back and doing this and then they test them last minute. So I have like four or five answers from experts on these. Um, each for each assessment, but ultimately we would like to go back and get more precise measurements from a variety of people from novice to expert. And it is interesting to note that in our first parsing of measurements, um, we do notice a difference between the students who are getting the answers right the first time and the students that aren't in terms of like, um, first of all, putting your black probe and ground and measuring the feedback loop at all, right? Like that right there is the number one thing setting apart the students who get the answer right or not. And we're gonna have to do some more toying to figure out whether this is just lack of effort 
or the other students just, it never occurs to them to measure the feedback loop because why would you look there? Um, but it is interesting that I can actually look at their measurement data and I can kind of see, like I can get a pretty educated guess just by looking at the back end, like, yeah, you solved this problem or you didn't based on where they were taking measurements. So that's why I like that specific one. And we've kept that specific problem with the circuit term after term, just because it's hidden and they have to actually interpret measurements. Yeah, that's He's okay. asking, do you have a list of ideas for debugging that you would use to help train the students? And do you have any thoughts that would help you quantify good debugging versus ineffective debugging, like number of measurements or measurements make more sense? Or how would you, so do you have ideas for teaching it? And then how might you quantify this? Um, so I personally have a couple ideas on this. I, I don't have a lot of data for you yet unfortunately, because we're in the process of all this. But um, one of the things I ended up doing as we improved debugging journals over the quarters is I realized a good question for students who didn't know where to start was, what do you know is working? Hmm. Because this gave them the confidence that they actually knew something and allowed them to start eliminating things and isolating the problem. Because isolating the problem seemed effective tools for isolating the problem, like coming up with effective ways to isolate the problem seem to be one of the, like the issues they were having. Um, and I say that based a little bit off of our, our test of the brainstorming, because at first we thought, oh, they're just, they can't come up with what was wrong with the circuit. And if they can't even brainstorm it, then of course they won't get to the answer. But then after we ran all those studies of open-ended versus closed form, we realized that it wasn't like them seeing the idea in the list suddenly like got them more to the answer. And so that's when I started questioning more like, okay, maybe it's not that they can't come up with the idea. Maybe it's more they just don't know how to actually test and isolate that problem if they have an idea. Um, and so um, I think I think this will have to be studied further, but yeah, the fact that there are so many people who don't even look at the feedback loop right now is of, of somewhat of a concern, for example, in the op amp problem. And as I'm parsing the data for the other ones, the text-based adventures, um, we're mostly, when you say good debuggers, we're mostly looking for things like um, false conclusions from data. Um, that's something like we, we, we tag whenever we notice somebody like looked at a piece of information and came to a wrong conclusion. Um, so I guess that would be an example of what I would call bad debugging skill, maybe. Um, but that's going to be some kind of theoretical model probably involved. That's actually the problem that we need to fix. Um, and I think the I think the key I would say with ineffective versus effective debugging is perseverance. Mm. The students who are confident get to the answers. The students who think they can debug seem to be the ones getting to the answers when I watch them in lab. And so I, I think there's a lot of the meandering, that's the beauty of these kind of choose your own adventures. And it kind of gives those other ones confidence because they can keep trying until they get it right. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of soft, squishy skills involved in debugging that at first I as a scientist was like loath to even think about, but you know, they panic, they're in lab, they have a three hour lab session, they wanna finish in time and oh no, the circuit's not working. And then they panic and they can't come up with ideas. They're freaking out and you have to say, go take a walk. You have to help them like emotionally regulate through this because they can't solve it unless that's done. Um, and so, yeah, there's going to have to be some more thinking on what it means to be an effective or an ineffective debugger. Um, but I would point to some hallmarks like, did they measure the minimal needed places to actually get the information they needed to solve this problem? Um, and like I say, we see the teachers and we see the best students, right, taking a fairly straight path through this, right? Like they're not getting caught up every step of the way. They get the gain right the first time. They take the needed measurements and on the first or second try, they get what's wrong with the circuit, right? So like 
for me, that is a successful debugger in this storyline. Um, I guess that's how I'd probably define one right now based on what we've seen so far. Okay, cool. Um, when students are taking measurements, are they primarily voltage resistance measurements or are they also doing like current continuity, diode orientation? What measurements do they get to do? I would love them to be able to do all of the above. And mm -hmm. the original plan was to have them do all of the above. And then our undergrad doing research for us had to go home to India for mm -hmm. COVID and visa problems. <clears throat> and so we ended up having to push a lot of that to the side for now. Um, they can do some of those things as a text-based adventure, but the only thing that they can do with the measurement tool right now on our, web, our own web page is take voltage measurements, unfortunately. And that was some of the feedback we got from a few students. They're like, I wish I could have measured resistance or something. And it's like, yeah, I want that someday too. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. Okay. Um, Josh asked, can you simulate smoke and sparks in the virtual <laughs> lab as they seem to be very helpful in a learning environment? Yes. I totally agree. I'm always telling the students they need to use all five of their senses. Um, yeah. So we did have one of the text-based adventures um, involved an inverter where both of the transistors were on. And one of the things you could do is touch the transistors to feel if they were hot. And mm -hmm. if you ever clicked that button, it quickly became apparent where the problem was. But you know, half the class never clicked that choice. So. Um, uh, that was the only time we really had like a smell or touch involved. Um, but I agree that is important. And I have thought about that before with these debugging things that I wish I could have all the senses involved. Okay, here's another from Nick. Uh, do you think the student's ability to troubleshoot is based very much on how well they understand the material up to that point, the theoretical material, I assume? Yes. Um, I think, so theoretical understanding is important, but we also have some of our best debuggers I've seen in labs now that I've watched what a thousand students at least come through the system in the last few years. And I go in lab and watch them a lot. Um, there is a category of people who aren't as strong on the tests, but they do very well at debugging. Um, so I don't think it's a be all end all kind of thing. Like you have to be good at theory to be a good debugger. Um, and like I say, I think there's some other traits that get involved there then, right? Is like, how precise are they in lab? Do they like write down the numbers as they take measurements? Are they methodical about it? Are they able to stay calm? Are they confident that they can find the problem? Like all these things play a role also um, in their ability to successfully solve the problem. Okay, here's another question uh, from Paul Kuhn. Are the students allowed to run simulators like SPICE in parallel so that they can work through the what the measurements should look like? Or yes. are they just debugging? Okay. We actually, um, we don't actually use SPICE with our students. We actually use every circuit in the intro class. So they all have licenses for every circuit for the term. So they are allowed to use that as much as they want for uh, simulation and calculations. Okay. Well, that's the end of the questions in chat. Does anyone have a question that you'd like to just unmute and ask? Okay, then so I'm so actually- I'll, I'll bite on the optics question. How did you <laughs> okay. apply this to an optics experiment? Yeah, so would you? Um, we actually, what we did in that case was we did something called a black box experiment. So basically you're told where the object and the image are and there's like a box and you're supposed to say what one possible con configuration of the lens or lenses could be. Hmm. And so we ran that first, we had like 10 students come in and do it like thinking out loud to us. We got some ideas of what common wrong answers were. And probably the biggest shocker there was our grad students performed worse than the undergrads from intro optics maybe partially because the intro optics students had less models to use in their head and they had just mm. taken it the previous quarter. I don't know, but they actually outperformed the grad students who worked in optics labs, which was funny. Mm. Um, and then we used their answers to create, um, they ended up using it in the intro optics class at Stanford in the physics department um, as like a study for the final. So it was an optional study for the final. So I ended up having to format it so that they got immediately the answers. Um, 
for feedback. So they felt like they were learning something and getting ready for the final. And so basically that involved mainly the drag and drop questions, kind of like you saw um, previously for brainstorming for the circuits. So it's like the big question each time would be like, well, what combination of lenses could possibly be in the box? And they'd be getting, you know, a single concave, a single convex, a concave and a convex, and they kind of sorted those options. And that was very telling. Um, that was actually a very interesting way of telling who was more advanced and who was less advanced, because there were certain cases where like two lenses could be put uh, two convex lenses, if they were put like a focal length from the object in the image, right, that would be like a special case where it would still work. And so like the more advanced students would like realize that and put that as an option, or the other students would say, no, it's not possible. So you're actually able to kind of split students into groups um, even further using those drag and drop questions. But the actual interesting thing we ended up noticing there or studying was it was a theoretical physicist teaching the intro optics class at the time, he really pushed math. And so one thing I noticed in the like 10 students when they, they were in lab and I watched them was the students who started with math equations performed worse, all of them, than the ones who started out by doing quick ray tracing diagrams or using kind of like qualitative analyses like, oh, the convex lens will like invert the image and make it bigger. And then I'll do like those kind of people building their solution like that ended up and then only using math at the end they were performing better when we watched them in interviews so we were kind of wondering on the online version with like 100 students doing it like is that also true and yes it turned out the students who said i want to use a math equation first versus the students who said they would break it down into two individual um, single lens systems the multi-lens problem um, the students who said they break it into two single lens systems instead of going to the math first, they perform better on almost every other question in the assessment. Um, and it was statistically significant, even though only 50 students finished the entire assessment. Um, so that was kind of a wake up call, I think, for that theoretical physics professor about pushing math maybe isn't, or I hope that was a wake up for him that pushing math is maybe not the right thing to do. But. It's not the only thing to do, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, we've actually reached the end of our time in the seminar. Um, if there's anyone who would like to stay and just chat with Amy, please feel free. But um, I'd like us to all give her a um, either unmuted or a virtual round of applause for joining us today. So thank you very much for uh, coming to the University of Utah, coming via relative term here. Zoom. <laughs> Zooming in, zooming to the University of Utah. Um, we really do appreciate your by, Tara, Tara has a question before it disappears, which okay. I think is a good question okay. about dissemination. Uh, okay, let me scroll back up. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I would love it to spread further, um, for sure. So if anybody is interested in using this in our own classes, like, let me know. We are happy to share material, and I'm happy to teach how I figured out how to use Qualtrics in the most complicated way possible with these like, where you keep going, going, going until you get the right answer. It was actually very hard to figure out how to program that in Qualtrics at first. So, or if there's somebody with a CS background who wants to make like a nice website, but it's just so hard to do the data management on the back end. It's like Qualtrics just saves you so much energy there on the back end. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate this.